So hello everybody and welcome to the sixth of our Walk In My Shoes web series. Um, today we are, well, following on from last week's call when everybody was discussing the highlighted and highlighting the findings of the report published by the Beacon Collaborative, we are excited to bring you a conversation around the role of philanthropy and social investment in bringing about social change during challenging times from the perspective of both advisor and clients. As the response funds are now deploying their income to the areas most needed, it's apparent that we need to start to bring the focus on what's next. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers for today, Matthew Bocock, who is a philanthropist and the co-founder of the Beacon Collaborative. Our board member, Natasha Muller, I hope I've said that right, yes. um, social, who is a social impact investor. Our board member, Rachel Harrington, who's the executive director, head of Coots Institute at Coots and Greg Davies, Head of Behavioural Finance, Oxford Risk. It's a big mouthful for me on a Monday. Who will be discussing what is driving the mindset of those with wealth right now. Please remember to be respectful of the conversation last speakers as always, and do use the chat. Uh, I've had a few phone calls this week from people who wanted to check that they're okay, that, that we're happy for them to use it. So if we are, please do, please send questions. We want a discussion, we'd like your input. And following on from this, because it is only 30 minutes, we have a LinkedIn group that we would really like more input in. So please do join it, the link is in the chat. And I will now pass over to my CEO, John Pepin. Hi, welcome everyone. And thank you, uh, Rachel, Greg, Natasha, and Matthew for participating in this. Uh, we have a large audience joining us, so um, I'm really excited about uh, what's happening. Um, how have you all been uh, through this? How many people are suffering from cabin fever? And I guess, Matthew, more than just cabin fever. Are you all surviving? Yep. Yeah, great. Just about. Just about? <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so Rachel, um, these are exceptional times with, with many heroes and Camus has um, defined heroism as ordinary people doing extraordinary things uh, out, of a, out of simple decency. Uh, does this ring true to you and are you seeing this in, in your uh, work and with your colleagues? Yeah, thank you, John, and thank you to Philanthropy Impact for, for having me. It's nice to be uh, back amongst my advisory community and colleagues. Um, I think that's a really beautiful definition, and it certainly rings true in these times, because I think what it's proven to us all is that none of us live in a bubble, none of us exist in a vacuum, um, and it's really highlighted just how interconnected we all are and how much we depend on each other um, and the different roles that we play. And um, we're, we're all impacted in different ways and we have all responded in different ways according to to our capability and my, my new colleague Victoria Papworth who joined us earlier this year from UK Community Foundations has put it quite beautifully where she said that this is about philanthropy as, as an attitude as much as it is about an action and we've certainly seen clients coming to us over recent weeks wanting to respond in different ways so we've seen some uh, want to take really clear collective action so you may have seen the players together initiative amongst the premiership footballers all coming together to, to support a common cause we've seen clients who are entrepreneurs pivoting their businesses uh, to respond so moving from luxury food manufacture to supplying food for nhs workers uh, people working in recruitment in healthcare uh, changing uh, the way they do business and, and creating charitable initiatives on the side people with foundations making emergency grants to their existing grantees and, and people responding directly in all sorts of creative ways. And I think from an advisor's perspective, thinking about the best ways that we can help those clients right now, I think it boils down to four things. One is about understanding their personal situations very deeply. Um, the second is about being that translator and helping them cut through uh, all the noise and the information that's coming at them. One is around drawing on networks and collaborations, you know, such as this one uh, to help people move really quickly, but also give as effectively as possible and, and not try and reinvent the wheel. Um, and the fourth one is to really short, I think both short, medium and long term. Um, so on a personal level, it gives us the chance to get to know our clients so much better and start some of those longer term discussions about their values. But from a philanthropic perspective, we can also look for what opportunities and challenges there might be for the long term and actually where there might be some silver linings to invest in doing things differently. Um, I've been really struck by some of the conversations I've had, for example, with charities in the homelessness sector in London, 
about how this crisis has thrown them together and they found themselves collaborating and working together far more than they ever would have and achieved things that they didn't think you know they, they were capable of um, and similarly around the environment and the climate crisis that we face um, there are various golden nuggets there that, that we may be able to to jump on um, and invest in a better future. So, uh, so the role of professional advisors then is really key to a lot of this these people trying to do some good and to be heroes themselves in a, in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, it was interesting being being in a bank when uh, everyone started to work from home and lockdown happened. And of course, our, our key purpose as a financial institution is to help people with their money and make sure that we were doing all of that very safely. But we very quickly started to see a flood of inquiries coming through from clients about philanthropy and what they could or what they felt they should be doing. Um, and I was quite struck by the point in the giving experience report that came out um, from Beacon and the Institute of Fundraising recently about the importance of relationships and uh, wealthy people's anxieties about their financial situation. So I think it's key for advisors to really understand their clients' personal situations and what different hats they might be wearing. What are their worries as a parent or a sibling, as an entrepreneur and an employer? Um, and as a philanthropist um, and how might they best use their resources and then as I said it's it's a sort of translation role um, I've been surprised by how many clients have only seemed to just realize for example that hospices are not fully government funded and just a core part of the NHS and, and rely on charitable support um, clients are being bombarded quite rightly and understandably with different emergency appeals um, and different information so I think our job as advisors is to be able to collate all of that information, distill it, know who we can pick up the phone to, know who's doing uh, effective things in different sectors um, and find ways to help our clients join the dots. Thank you. Um, Matthew, the, uh, uh, Rachel just mentioned the Beacon report that just came out. It talks about the current state of giving in the UK amongst a number of things. Um, what do you see is happening with different philanthropists reacting to the current uh, crisis? Do you see any change? Um, is there a change in behavior in the way they're giving their money? And is there more money coming in? I think there's well, one of the great ironies about the current situation, and by the way, Beacon has been pivoting to try and focus more on trying to monitor and examine exactly what's happening out there and be able to put forward case studies so that there's a positive narrative about the role that philanthropy is playing, which is very important. But um, I think just as the report that we issued spoke about how fundraisers often homogenize all high net worth individuals as being the same, and segmentation of them is important, it's also people are reacting in completely different ways. So you've got a certain group which you might call the first responders who leapt into the important, and we're seeing things in, in terms of three phases, relief, recovery, and resilience. At least this is what we think will happen. And we're still in the relief stage, but we're just starting to think about what the recovery stage might look like. So there's a certain number of people that have left in very quickly. Of course, um, one of the ironies is that they were forced to pivot from being strategic philanthropists to being tactical relievers of, of, of what you might call symptoms rather than causes. So, you know, we're taught through our philanthropy training to be strategic and develop a theory of change. And all of a sudden, what you're responding to is a sense of guilt that you've got so much and others haven't, and the need that that implies. And I think it would be tragic if philanthropy actually lost that empathetic response, but it means that, some, that you're having to pivot from being strategic to tactical. I think some people have found that very difficult to do, particularly as they're often swamped with other issues. Another assumption is that high net worth philanthropists have nothing else to do with their time. Most of them are on the boards of companies, They've got uh, members of staff who work for them. They've got family offices. Oh, and there is somebody looking over there, looking at their portfolio and discovering they've lost 30% of their total net worth. Oh, and their philanthropic foundation has got a load of equities and no cash in the bank, and therefore to make a donation, it's got to sell the equities for 30% less than they were worth a month or two again. So a number of them, I think, are frozen in the headlights by these things, but by these multiple different factors all coming to play. I think there are some who are being very measured about it and saying which are the charities and how are they going to change as we come out of this which are the ones i will want to support 
not because I'm historically supporting them for years and years, but because they're the ones who are going to be key in the future. And if we have a winnowing of charities in the landscape, which ones are we going to pick to really invest in for resilience in the future in things like technology? Because, you know, I, I heard Will Perrin the other day say, frankly, the sector is antediluvial with its use of technology. And that's one area in which we might see significant change as a result. But the things that worry me a bit about these different responses are that there is a risk that there's some diversion of funds. So people have an annual philanthropic budget in their foundations or in how much they give or they're comfortable about. And then we get the second year when we get to recovery and resilience and find the budget has already been spent and often spent on something which was very appealing like an NHS charity, which is now being swamped because it's the thing that is most easy to appeal to. So I think there is a risk that some of the instant response has, has diverted money, so it hasn't been incremental charitable money. And finally, I worry that out there, there's a cohort of latent donors who really want to respond. And this is where professional advisors are incredibly important. People who are not known as habitual philanthropists, but know that in a sense, this is, this is our generation's war and therefore will be marked out by how we respond, and therefore they want to join in, but really struggle to know how, because they have not been historically major philanthropists, but they have the capacity. So I really hope we can turn this from crisis into opportunity from a philanthropy point of view. Matthew, the, um, um, interesting about the recovery and uh, that stage, um, what kinds of measurements are people using to decide who should uh, survive because of their impact or whatever. Uh, is there any clarity on that at all at this point? Well, if you go back to the Beacon Report, a lot of it was about the importance of developing trust. And those organizations, I think, that engage their philanthropists in understanding the problems they face and how they're planning to address them <clears throat> are much more likely to get the long-term support than those that offer very simple appeals. I mean, so I think those that are using this as an opportunity to invite their donors in as shareholders, as stakeholders, are the ones which will be the long-term beneficiaries of it. So that's really interesting. It fits with the training that we're doing of high value fundraisers, trying to get them to not treat people as donors, but as clients. And that could make a big difference. Natasha, um, uh, what pressures are you feeling as a uh, philanthropist, as a, uh, social impact in investor and how are you dealing with those? Well, actually, I think Matthew answered quite a lot of a lot of the questions. I'm going to pick up a couple of uh, the topics he mentioned. I think the main one that most philanthropists are facing right now is we're just overwhelmed by opportunities. Like Matthew said, I mean, my inbox is full um, and there are trade-offs and opportunity costs. We have limited time, limited resources. And if you're an empath like me and you kind of have this do-gooder notion, you want to save the world, it's like where you put your capital most effectively because you can't give to every organization that asks for funds. And again, like Matthew said, most philanthropists kind of have a strategy. So when I look at what I want to do with my capital, I set priorities from the outset. Um, and philanthropy is part of that. So philanthropy, social investment, and in my case, kind of activism and lobbying and advocacy. So those are my three pillars of kind of how I want to implement social change. And um, I think when a crisis like this happens, it's, you have to decide whether you're going to look at your long-term strategy and also focus on the outside, like what's happening after Corona and building up resilience, or if you give immediately. And where is it most effective? So again, like Matthew said, most funds are going into the NHS right now. And I think that it's great. You know, that's emotional giving. But I think that has to be tempered a little bit with strategic giving. And to be able to give or to invest, you kind of have to have a world view. And I think one of the other problems at the moment is I don't really know what the world view is. And there's a whole load of misinformation and a lack of data uh, from the field. And by this, I really mean like what's, I mean, I'm stuck at home, right? So it's very difficult to really know what's going on out there. And I don't know if governments being that honest or, you know, yeah, they don't know themselves. And I think advisors are really important, not only to help navigate the field, like Rachel said, but also to act as a sounding partner 
because no one really knows what's going on. And to be able to give effectively, you kind of have to have a view on that. And I think one of the reasons that the crisis has been so bad is because it's put so much pressure on existing fault lines. And the healthcare system was underfunded. I'm a mental health act uh, activist as well. So I look at the mental health space. Now it's being discussed everywhere. And it takes time to build that up. And a lot of the time, some of the most effective philanthropy is the stuff that's not sexy. It doesn't have immediate impact. It doesn't have immediate heroism. It takes time to build up. Um, so I think those are some of the pressures that we have. How do you create maximum impact when there's so much need? Um, so I try to look at organizations that have a ripple effect. So I'm working with an organization called Manch. Uh, it's a tech platform that uh, facilitates online giving. And so I provided some capital to them. And I think that the impact that that will have is much bigger because it enables other people to join in and provides data and information. So that's one example that I've been trying to do. From a mental health perspective, um, uh, what are you seeing in terms of some of the uh, charities and social investments uh, 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 um, enterprises uh, are facing? And if you're isolated at home, how are you managing yourself around all that? So when you ask me about mental health, you mean the charities themselves or mental yeah. health charities? People help people working in charities, how they're doing, your colleagues who are fellow entrepreneurs and, and uh, impact investors, um, people isolated at home and that kind of thing. We know Matthew, for example, has just uh, got over the virus and uh, has uh, had to deal with that. But from your peer group, what are you seeing? I mean, I think mental health issues are being talked about everywhere and it's on the rise. Health anxiety, economic anxiety, fear, social isolation, loneliness in particular, they're known to have a massive impact on health and well-being and you know, precursors to, to depression. And I think one of the beautiful, I mean, it's not great that mental health is finally being addressed under these circumstances, but I'm glad that finally it's, because it's being prioritized. And I really hope, again, that moving out of this, we learn some lessons and the that the charitable sector can really um, provide, you know, fill in those gaps. Um, I think research has really shown that workers in specific professions, such as doctors and nurses, they're particularly at risk uh, of workplace mental health issues. In pandemics, there is a correlation between increase in suicide rates. So for example, during SARS, it increased by 50%. So all those things need to be addressed. And that takes kind of social cohesion, social capital, social networks. And actually that's been the prerogative of the charitable sector. So I think philanthropic giving can really support those community systems and those social cohesion strategies that can improve mental health. And your other question was about being homebound. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I'm not doing too bad. I mean, I'm on my own, but I've got a garden and everything, but it's tough. We're like, we're social creatures. And I just think not being able to touch people, not being able to speak to people, it creates a sense of distrust. And I think trust along any kind of form of investment, be it charitable or social impact, that's the fundamentals or the bedrock of the system. And without that, it, it creates a lot of tension. Okay, thank you. Greg, from your perspective, uh, as um, working in behavioral finance, you've done some work in the past about philanthropy from that perspective. Um, what, um, uh, what's in your, what do you do in your work that might help uh, increase philanthropic giving um, and to help with some of the confusion that seems to exist? Uh, as Matthew mentioned, there are uh, people who want to do a lot latent donors, but how do they get involved? But there's also other people that um, um, are not getting involved for a variety of reasons, and how can we get them involved? Yeah, I, I think a lot of what's been said so far is very much about the, the best strategy for the donors who are already engaged. You know, how do we point them to the right things? How do we get people to you know, not be uh, enticed by the immediately emotionally appealing thing. But there's an awful lot, in fact, the bulk of people out there who, who simply don't fall in that category. And the first thing we need to do is just encourage them to be sending something somewhere. And we can worry about the details of, of what the something and the somewhere are later. 
And I think that engagement is, is for many people the, the, the biggest challenge. Um, what we do as an organization um, in this space is particularly, we have done a lot of background research work in the UK, in the US, in Asia, understanding attitudes towards uh, doing social good with your wealth. So this isn't just philanthropy, it's philanthropy plus responsible investing plus impact investing, etc. And off the back of that, we now have built a suite of client profiling tools that can be used to understand at an individual level, what is it about this person that makes them different from someone else that helps us to understand which buttons to push, which causes might appeal to them the most. Um, and we've got you know, huge amounts of baseline data that we can compare this to. And the reason we would do that is primarily about engagement. It's about saying that if you want to get people to donate or invest in, in socially useful things, people do not buy numbers, people buy stories. And we need to be telling them the story that is most resonant with them. And we need to be understanding them as an individual. Someone right at the beginning, uh, forgive me, I can't remember who made this point, um, but the importance of the personal situation. So the personal situation is both my cultural background and my financial personality and my set of attitudes, as well as my wealth level. So the more we understand deeply the person in front of us, the more we can help to guide them into being comfortable with actually giving money away. And then of course, there's a whole bunch of downstream questions about who do we give to most effectively, et cetera. But just understanding at the outset, um, you know, are they, one of the scales that we measure is, uh, we call um, philanthropic orientation. It's simply a measure of, is this a person who is more comfortable donating money or more comfortable with the thought of doing social good through repeatable investment opportunities? And people can be reliably measured to fit on different sides of that scale. And if you know who's in front of you, you have an opportunity then to start crafting the, the dialogue with them. Um, and so that becomes extremely important. The other thing that I think is extremely important is the, the, the point about anxiety about people's wealth. It's not just your uh, current personality or emotional situation. It's also your, your current wealth situation. And in times like this, when many people are seeing income streams dry up, when many people, well, we're all you know, sequestered away, we naturally, I think, start to think shorter term and think closer to home. And we think about personal resilience and family resilience and protecting ourselves. So there's a lot of people who in better times might be easy donors, who right now are thinking sort of a version of the, um, uh, the Augustine prayer, you know, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. Um, you know, I want to do good with my wealth, but right now, my focus is more on my family and my, my personal security. And we have to recognize these as genuine issues amongst donators uh, uh, or, or, or investors, because unless we talk people through that anxiety, it's very difficult to get them to the point where they are comfortable to donate money or, or comfortable to invest. And I think um, what for me is fundamentally important is and this is true of all financial decisions. Most people make bad financial decisions. They don't save enough, they don't invest enough, they don't insure enough. And that transcends to donating activities and investing activities as well. And two fundamental reasons come in here. One is it's complex. People have to navigate that complexity and most people faced with complexity step away from it and go, I'll solve that problem next month or next year. And the second problem that in addition to being complex is it's quite easy for this never to seem like today's problem. It can be today, tomorrow's problem. Of course, I want to do good with my wealth, but I can always do that next month. And if we place that burden of complexity on the end donor or the end investor, um, we're making it more likely that they will step away from a decision. So we have to build frameworks that can guide them to better decisions. And one of the things that strikes me in philanthropy is the complete lack of a society-wide number of what is the right level for me to donate on an annual basis. No one has that in their mind. In fact, the only thing we probably have in our mind from that is the old church version of a tithe. I should give away 10% of my income. But because many of us don't have simple socially validated rules we can rely on, we tend to step away from the problem altogether and go, I don't know how much to give. 
So I won't give anything because that's easier for me to do. Okay, thank you very much. There are um, two questions that have come in. Uh, Matthew, can you do a 30 seconds so I can get some of the questions that have come in through the chat? Yes, just, just two comments. I completely agree with Greg in many aspects. And we are in the process of being going to try to develop the numbers based upon recent survey data as to what the norms should be. What does the word generous mean? How can I sleep at night feeling I'm comfortable to be generous? Well, what percentage of your assets is that per year? And we want to be able to develop those norms so people understand at a personal level where they fit on it. Um, the, the, the other point is that the number of comments you made I completely agree with about removing complexity in order to provide what I call easy entry points into philanthropy. But what's really important is they end up being rewarding by the feedback mechanism. So if somebody doesn't end up getting the feedback from where they donate because the intermediary wants to divorce them from the end cause, because uh, they don't want to lose them as a key philanthropist, then they don't end up getting engaged. So there's a lot of, lot of evidence that people have tried once and found it unrewarding and therefore not come back to it. And that's okay. a really important aspect of the easy entry points. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a question uh, from Felicity Jones, uh, so I'll just read it out. Uh, how can we keep the focus on global priorities, e.g. support African health resist resilience, as well as more emotive and immediate visible needs such as the NHS in the UK. Um, Natasha, do you want to take a bit of uh, a response to that? I was afraid you were going to ask me. That's a really tough question. Um, and I don't really have an answer. And I think, again, it comes down to, unfortunately, like priorities and strategy. And I, I yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's an issue. I think, like Greg said, you tend to, what I think what this crisis has done is like made visibility much narrower so our focus is like in our immediate vicinity and what's happening to us right because that's what we can feel and that's what we can respond to and I think the need in and I don't really like this term low and middle income countries I don't really like classifying like that but I think they're they're facing a double whammy so you know in the west again don't you like these terms but we started off with a health crisis and it's become an economic crisis they're going to start with an economic crisis and then get the health crisis and that's particularly difficult and i honestly i really don't have an answer i'm just hoping that through some of the sophisticated well again with manch what what manch is doing i think i love so they're providing a they're mapping the philanthropic giving globally so we can find out exactly where what money is going to to what and to see where the gaps are and to see if we can funnel um capital into areas that are not being touched so i'm hoping that that's one way and i know that i think it's duke university is also working on some kind of data analytic tool that can help with that um, so i think information is really key at the moment to helping that is that a good answer i'm not sure <laughs> john, john can i can i add to that very quickly I think I think that the two potential buttons that we can press here one is around that interconnectedness you know that it, we've been shown here in the UK how connected we are even with with each other and this pandemic has shown us that globally we share opportunities and we share risks that come with globalization so there that we could if we can play on expanding that sense beyond me my family my community to the way we're connected that's one one angle and I think the other that I was starting to allude to earlier is you know what might be possible that we didn't think was possible before in this shared experience and this shared calamity that we've been through when things you know the fact that you can see the Himalayas from parts of India that you could not see in a generation you know that the fact that we may be able to think differently about the way we live and the way we relate to each other if funders and philanthropists can find a way to harness those little sort of shining stars of opportunity um, and encourage us to think big and think very differently about some of the challenges that we face that may help to give us a launch pad to, to not lose sight of those global issues as well as protecting those nearest and closest to us. Okay, great. Thank you. We have about 35 seconds left. Can we have one or two words from each of you before we cut out? Matthew. I would say that if you're transitioning to local, use the local trusted ecosystems for evaluating who's doing good work and who isn't and find the trusted individuals who you're willing to back or with, rather than trying to do your own due diligence. Okay, thank you. Greg? Um, make it personal. Everyone is looking 
you know, very most people want to do good with their wealth. The question is, they will do it if you lower the emotional barriers for you to do it. That means telling people the right stories. Thanks. Rachel. Uh, it might seem like you're alone, but you're really not. You know, there is a whole community and network out there of people who have uh, information and resources and opportunities to share so don't try and reinvent the wheel but explore who's out there who can help thank you natasha uh i'm going to end with a statistic because it blew my mind the national council of voluntary organizations estimated that uk charities face a 4.3 billion hit to their finances the government has only pledged support of 750 million and they worked out that the value that the charitable sector generates is more than 200 billion pounds, which is approximately 10% of GDP. Just give. Thanks, thank you very much. Thank you all of you for uh, contributing to this. It's been absolutely fabulous. Sophia, I'm on time, can you imagine? I'm really impressed, thank you, John. Um, thanks everybody for taking part. Um, remember that any questions that you may have, we do have the LinkedIn group. Please just join us. Um, you just request, we'll accept you in. You can ask questions there. The panelists will dip in and out when time allows to answer any questions and get involved in the debate. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for joining us once again. We will be back this time. Well, no, it's early next next week, isn't it? Is it, yeah. John? Next week is early at 9.30 in the morning because it's on uh, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia and Asian philanthropy and how they're reacting. And we have people from Hong Kong and Singapore who will be joining us. So that seems to be the best time to have them join us. So. Morning session. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.